and we're picking up on chapter 9 of Barry and the Boys, The CIA, The Mob, and America's Secret History by Daniel Hopsicker. A Perfect Failure Before events in Dallas made questioning moot, President Kennedy commissioned a study of the Bay of Pigs fiasco called the Taylor Report. It was so critical of the CIA that it was classified until recently, but the conclusions it drew became obvious when Kennedy fired the top CIA leadership of Dulles, Cabell, and Bissell. Military, militarily, the 1,400-man Cuban exile force was crushed by Castro's far larger military and militia in 72 hours. The exile force could neither hold back nor break out of the beachhead at Playa Guido. 114 Cuban brigade members were killed, 1,189 captured. The Bay of Pigs was a historian. The Bay of Pigs was, as historian Theodore Draper has observed, one of those rare events in history, a perfect failure. It doesn't take Price Waterhouse to tell you that. 1,500 Cubans aren't as good as 25,000 Castro fighters, Secretary of State Dean Atkinson told President Kennedy as the operation collapsed. As a covert operation which Washington could plausibly deny, the invasion also failed miserably. Kennedy, in office less than 12 weeks, called it the worst experience of my life, but nonetheless assumed responsibility. There's a saying that victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. He told the press, I am the responsible officer of the government. U.S. credibility as a world leader was also dealt a harsh blow. Acute shock and disillusion, disillusion dominated the reaction in Western Europe with an un provoked attack on Cuba's sovereignty that left over 1,800 military and civilian dead and wounded European hopes for Kennedy's intelligence, vision, and fresh approach to the Cold War had been wiped away. The Washington and Washington was perceived to be as self-righteous, trigger-happy, and incompetent as it ever had been. It was the decision to invade and not its failure that bothered Western European political leaders. Arthur Schlesinger noted, Why was Cuba such a threat to you, they asked. Why couldn't you live with Cuba as the USSR lives with Turkey and Finland? Kennedy thought he was approving a plan that could succeed with help from Cuban underground fighters and military deserters, and an eventual uprising of a rebellious population. He was not informed of Castro's relative popularity, stated Taylor's report. The canceled second airstrike, the cause of the controversy, and the wedge the CIA used against Kennedy with its Cuban charges is like the Gulf of Tonkin incident and the Sandinista drug smuggling uncovered by Barry Siegel. Much ado about nothing. It is a clear example of the CIA doing what the CIA does best, lying. Because even with full control of the skies, the ragtag 1800-man invasion force could never have defeated Castro's forces without an all-out American invasion, and this would almost certainly have resulted in a wider war with Cuba's Soviet backers. We read startling revelations about the Bay of Pigs affair in the matter-of-fact testimony of a New York City detective who later arrested Frank Sturgis for planning the murder of former girlfriend Maria Lorenz. Lorenz had decided to go public and testify about what she knew about the Kennedy assassination to the House Select Committee in 1976. The event had prompted a New York Daily News headline reading, Ex-spy says she drove to Dallas with Oswald and Kennedy assassin squad. NYPD detective James Rothstein intercepted the infuriated Sturgis on his way to Lorenz's home to murder her in what he said that Sturgis had described as a sanctioned hit. Rothstein told the Daily News, I talked to Sturgis when I arrested him. See, I had 
Frank Sturgis two hours before anybody knew we had him. I told Sturgis about being in the Bay of Pigs invasion on an aircraft carrier that didn't exist. And so when I grabbed Sturgis, the first thing I did was congratulate him for assassinating John F. Kennedy. I purposely did that, and when I told him that I had been on the Essex and that we had bombed that place, Cuba, for three days and three nights, Sturgis said, the only way you knew that is if you were there. Because it was unknown, and after that he took me in as one of his confidants. We talked for two hours. Rothstein had been a bosun's mate on the aircraft carrier Essex, he told us. The airship... The ship had all its markings painted out, and we took down the American flag. The pilots all wore white coveralls on their bombing missions, and the destroyers, also with markings painted over, bombed the shit out of the Cuban coast. Rothstein told us the Essex had put people ashore for the invasion, and that they had practiced for what would have been a first-time invasion landing off a carrier off the coast of Virginia. None of the squares... None of this squares with the official story, yet it sounds plausible. The bungling on the part of the CIA top echelon was so extreme that it very likely was deliberate, and the only way the Bay of Pigs invasion makes any military sense is if Kennedy authorizes a full American invasion. Clearly, this was something he would not do. What Dulles and his friends really wanted was a full-scale U.S. invasion of Cuba, numerous scholars attested. They were hoping to put Kennedy in such a compromised position that he would feel compelled to order it. Maybe Dulles thought he could manipulate Kennedy as easily as he and his brother John Foster had run the Eisenhower administration. What he could not have counted on was Kennedy's refusal to fall for the logic of a full American invasion, his willingness to accept defeat rather than be pushed into an overt invasion he did not want. The CIA hardball artists were convinced that when faced with the realities of the invasion, Kennedy would send in American forces rather than swallow defeat, said the CIA technical services man Robert Morrow later. They were wrong. On the eve of the invasion, CIA insiders began buying the stocks of sugar companies, the earnings of which had been depressed by the loss of Cuban plantations. Stockbrokers became curious about the sudden influx of orders on what one broker called the tip that cheap sugar shares might prove a sweet gamble. Prices were climbing sharply when the brigade hit the beach. In the Bahamas, Meyer Lansky, Lieutenant John Rivers waited with a satchel stuffed with gold for word to rush in and take charge of the dark casinos. Off the north Cuban coast, two gambling pals of Frank Sturgis and Mafia boss Russell Buffalino bobbed on the seas in a syndicate-owned boat with a CIA man aboard ready to land and dig up the 750,000 they had buried in Havana before fleeing Castro. Afterwards, though, Kennedy was outwardly calm and hopeful, rallying the morale of his men and planning ahead one of his closer a closest aides. Ted Sorensen found him beneath it all angry and sick at heart. He seemed a, dep a depressed and lonely man. Kennedy had handed his critics a stick with which they would forever beat him. How could I have been so far off base, he inquired aloud. All my life I had known better than depend on ec the experts. How could I have been so stupid as to let them go ahead? Intended to overthrow Castro, the invasion succeeded only in helping him to strengthen his regime er internally and enhancing his image as a David-defeating Goliath. Castro's position is stronger than before the invasion attempt, the CIA reported later, in a secret meeting in Uruguay five months later. Che Guevara even expressed Cuba's appreciation for the Bay of Pigs to White House aide Richard Goodwin. 
He wanted to thank us very much for the invasion, Goodwin reported to Kennedy. It had transformed them from an aggrieved little country into an equal. As the invasion ground as the invasion ground to its ignoble conclusion in Guatemala City, the CIA station chief was growing fanatic, not just about the project's failure, but also about the state of the Americans who had trained the brigade. Several of the CIA men had been on a drunk for three days, locked in a CIA safe house from which they refused to emerge. Their fury at the politicians in Washington was limitless. How would he would say later, reporting that he thought they were unsettled enough to kill people. If someone had gotten close to Kennedy, he'd had he'd have killed him. Oh, they hated him. Somewhere down there in Guatemala, amidst all the self-justifying hatred towards Jack Kennedy, was an enraged David Ferry and a young Barry Seal. Bit of a short chapter. Pick up a little bit later.